Okay, I think we're live. All right. Okay, everyone. Hello, 대한민국 여러분. 안녕하십니까? 네. Hello, everybody. This is a uh, CM from the Blockchainers, and we got some other people on the show today. So, guys, why don't you go around and start introducing yourselves? 네, 안녕하십니까? 저는 블로가트를 준비하고 있는 윤성주라고 합니다. Hey, guys. Uh, this is Tristan Yoon from Blog Arts and a previous host of Mr. Blockchain. Nice to meet you guys. Hello guys, this is Tony from Mr. Blockchain and Block Art, and also co-host of um, Studio Decentral. 안녕하십니까? 저는 그 미스터 블록체인을 운영하고 이제 블록 아트를 같이 준비하고 있는 송현창이라고 합니다. Hello everyone, uh, this is Loy Liu. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Kyber Network. Uh, it's great to you know be here on the blockchain as so. Just here for, I, I could hear I could hear the the crowd going crazy all our viewers just being like loy 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 okay <laughs> yeah and we're all and we're all here today to talk about um Kyber network so before we just uh, deep dive into the interview just want to give a couple of information so our interviews tend to be very deep and thorough so uh after if you're if you're seeing a recorded version of this we're gonna put up all the links to all the different material that we studied whether it be uh, videos blogs uh github whatever all that's gonna be down below we're also gonna have like questions and uh, timestamps of everything and uh, it, yeah it's it, like we're trying to create the make sure that the content that's created from the video is really like a summary of everything that's happened to Kyber up to this point so uh, please keep that in mind and also for the question and answer policy while we're uh, conducting the interview please feel free to ask any kind of questions we're we're very open to questions and we'll we'll take them um, as they come if they're appropriate uh, if they're appropriate in the context, but in the case that they're not appropriate, we'll field them all at the end of the uh, end of the show. So, I yeah, just wanted to let everybody know that. So, let's begin the interview. Awesome. Yeah, let's right. go. Okay. So, hey, Loi. Um, before we start uh, questioning you, why don't you just uh, give us like a brief explain explanation about the Kyber network? Wow. Okay. <laughs> so that's not part of the interview, right? Um, just kidding. So, uh, Kyber Network is a uh, you know decentralized chain that that really focuses on both security and usability. Uh, so, uh, from the security side, uh, we run everything uh, entirely on the blockchain, uh, and it's you know it, it will offer secure exchange with no single point of failure, and making it you know extremely difficult to compromise. Uh, regarding usability, we want to provide a seamless and and you know secure token conversion with guaranteed liquidity. So liquidity is a, is a major problem that we address because if you look at other decentralized chains, this it's really hard to find, you know, at the, uh, you know, other counterparty to trade with you. Uh, so, you know, Kyber Network uh, addresses both, uh, you know, the challenges in security and also usability for uh, decentralized chains. Yeah, that's something really hard to do. You're trying to go get, uh, kill two birds with one stone, with the Kyber stone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyways, uh, the second question is um, this again, this like not related to Kyber, but you know the market has been pretty gloom. How are you doing personally? Are you are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I mean, like uh, I'm still holding uh, my bags. Uh, I mean, I'm still holding all the tokens. Uh, I mean, I I have been in this industry for a long time. Uh, it's been like four or five years, um, and and I have seen this several times. So I'm still, you know, positive because, you know, the 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 the, the price is short term, right? Uh, but the impact and and what we are creating in this ecosystem is is long term, and we should focus more on that. Yeah. Before we begin the questions that we prepared, uh, there's there's there were some users that asked questions uh, via like Google Forms. So I'm good, I'm just gonna shoot those, and you can answer them. Uh, okay. the, the first one is, what kind of strategy do you have? to compete with existing exchanges such as Binance when Binance reveals that they plan on pivoting to also having decentralized exchanges? What's going to be your edge over them? So I think, uh, you know, from the announcement to to the point that they can actually release anything, it's going to take a long time because, you know, building, you know, building a decentralized chain is really hard because now your, your, your system is essentially exposed to the entire public, right? 
So you cannot hide anything. You cannot, you know, obscure any, you know, part of your system uh, uh, so that you can secure it. Um, running a public and decentralized chain essentially uh, requires you to publish everything uh, from your code, from your server, and and everything else, uh, so that the public can you know scrutinize it, right? And uh, if you have any flaw, uh, good luck with that because you know anyone can just you know get everything from your exchange and and from your users. So it's it's really hard to build a, a good and and you know usable decentralized chain. But I, I know that the, the Binance team is, is pretty good. Uh, so they have the capability to, you know, uh, build, uh, you know, the, the best agendas in the world. Um, but from our side, I think we still have, uh, you know, other, um, you know, competing uh, uh, actors. Uh, for example, um, we have been building our, our Kyber network exchange for almost a year. And we have been, like, you know, touring, uh, you know, testing it, right? We, we, we have run our, you know, testnet, our, our uh, you know, private tests and and you know even pilot program for a couple of months, uh, and we 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 do also offer different applications, uh, like you know all the on chain uh, you know interaction with other DApps, other smart contract, which I don't think any other decentralized chains can compete with it, with us. Uh, so in gen in general, I think uh, we wel we welcome competition, uh, we welcome healthy competition because it's gonna push the entire ecosystem forward. And it can also uh, offer, you know, the users more uh, services, which is, you know, uh, good for them. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Uh, as you said, you have just mentioned that you guys have run through some test nets. Have you guys seen any kind of a flaws or any kind of a major problems that you guys have fixed or are you guys planning to fix? So uh, we we do get uh, we do receive a lot of like you know feedbacks from from the users right uh, both from you know UI UX and also like you know on the security side uh, but so far there's no major flaw um, uh, so which is great uh, but you know we are we are working on you know the improve uh, the the improvement of the UI and UX of our chain. I really uh, like what you said. I it, it leads so well into the next question. Um, so. Generally, you know, everyone perceives Kyber to be an exchange, but you kind of mentioned that the edge that Kyber has over other projects is you guys have different applications that, you know, that can require Kyber. So are there any additional revenue models or projects you are pursuing or exploring? Right. Uh, so so a lot, right? Because uh, so, for example, currently we are pushing, uh, we, are, we are trying to work with uh, other wallets and, and the you know, uh, um, so with the wallets, what, what we want to do is we want them to integrate Kyber uh, in their wallet so the users can just, you know, easily exchange everything within the wallets. So they don't have to go to some add in additional website to, you know, do the service and conversion over there. Um, so which is, you know, extremely convenient for them because the coins never leave the wallet, right? Um, so for other, uh, we, we also like have other, uh, you know, um, applications, something like we can work with all the, you know, on-chain, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, so, so let, let me just give you an example, right? Uh, so there's uh, a few people are working on the derivative uh, uh, exchange, right? And, and one of the uh, major component that they want is, you know, the ability to liquidate uh, their portfolio on-chain because they run everything on the smart contract. And I think uh, apart from Kyber Network, there's no other uh, decentralized in this that, that can offer that service because we run everything on chain, right? Uh, and there's no way for, you know, uh, I mean, it's really impossible for a smart contract to seamlessly interact with any off-chain entity. Um, so I mean that's just one of the applications. Uh, we we still have like a lot of you know other similar system that really need uh, you know integration with on chain uh, decentralized chains like Kyber. Okay. Okay. So Kyber network uh, requires like a number of wallet providers such as like MetaMask or Miter Wallet for some of the uh, operation. So what kind of partnerships do you have or what kind of partnership? partnerships you plan to have in the future right uh, so we are we are trying to work with all the wallets uh, we, we have been like talking to uh, most of them and we have confirmed the partnership with uh, you know I am token which is the uh, you know most popular wallet in China 
and in fact uh, next week we are going to have some campaigns uh, with them so please you know uh, stay tuned and and watch out for our announcement um and uh, you know at the same time we are also like you know talking to uh, all the other popular wallets uh, and we are going to announce the uh, you know integration if uh, the the you know re relationship is formalized yeah knocker 88 on the chat is saying please make kyber interface downloadable like mu please offline transaction support via ui oh yeah so that that uh, actually already doable uh, with our wallet so you can just clone our code and and you know uh, run it offline so you don't have like, to go to kyber.network but you can just like run something on your local pc uh, but it's a little bit technical so i think uh, we need like, to give some tutorials or some things uh, for the technical users to 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 use that okay that's cool and uh, the final user question is uh i'm gonna i'm just gonna quote this when kyber was first listed i had high hopes now looking at the price it's kind of a letdown when you're not the newest kid on the block, naturally investors turn to other projects. What kind of plans do you have to retain users? And can Kyber buy back KNC in order to stabilize the price? Well, this is an interesting question. Uh, I mean, all the questions uh, regarding the price is interesting. Uh, uh, so um, in general, we, we, we are not like, you know, uh, trying to do anything to, uh, you know, to affect um you know manipulate the price because i don't think it's uh you know legal and uh but at the same time we we are we are so aware that the the price is you know uh it's not doing well uh so that's why we have been like trying hard to to push our platform uh our development you know faster and and to deliver our project um much earlier than than what we planned um and we also like you know trying to do a few other marketing campaigns to you know raise awareness uh, about platform of all the features that that kyber network uh, that kyber network provide uh, so at the end of the day you know we, we are still running a business so the adoption of the services that that, that we provide uh, is going to uh, play an important an important role uh, in the growth of the of the platform and also of the price so we hope that uh, with the uh, you know increase of the adoption um, and and of course the uh, you know the public awareness about the platform the price is going to follow. Okay, that's cool. Uh, that's a solid answer. Yeah, thank you so much for your answers for our viewers. And uh, we have actually prepared some questions for you. And uh, there are a few other parts, but we would like to uh, get into some problems that we can actually expect from Kyber Network. Since Kyber Network is a Ethereum-based dApp, I think all the Ethereum-based dApps are facing the scalability issues. Is there any solutions Kyber Network is actually working on it? Um, yes, so we have been like watching uh, other, uh, you know, observing and following other uh, scalability solutions closely. Uh, we are looking at Plasma and also, uh, you know, State Channel uh, and, of course, you know, Proof of Stake and, and Sharding as well. Uh, but all these, you know, solutions are going to take some time to, uh, to um, you know, be delivered, right? So what we, are, uh, what we are doing internally is also, we are also like working on our own scalability solution. So we have a small team of, you know, uh, two to three people uh, working on some uh, state channel solutions, uh, you know, specifically for Kyber network. Um, it's, not, it's not going to be like, you know, something like Red Hat network. But like how uh, you know more trips on Kyber um, without uh, you know relying on the skill uh, you know the performance of Ethereum network. Um, so we are making some progress, uh, and we we expect you know to have something to announce soon uh, once we have formalized all the technical details. Other than um, the state channels, the uh, plasma sharding, uh, proof of stake, uh, what? It, like because I know you've been in the Ethereum ecosystem for a long time. What other tools are available in the scalability toolkit for projects on Ethereum? And I'm just gonna throw this question with it because I know some projects are doing things like batching their transactions and whatnot in order to like lower the gas costs. So, uh, what? Yeah, what kind of things are you? Pers are, are what do you think? What What's the biggest thing for you? Is it like state channels? Is that your strongest thing right now? Uh, so I mean, like there are several ways to uh, scale up the the uh, you know the performance of uh, the Ethereum blockchains, right? And each of the solution will have some other trade-off. Either is you know security or or usability. 
So let's you know use some example, right? Plasma uh, is you know essentially is moving all the transaction to a different blockchain, which has a different you know security model. So um uh so so depending on on the need of, of, of the users, uh, you know some users may find that the security model that Plasma offers is not strong enough, so they may not be uh, you know willing to move to Plasma. Uh, but sharding, for example, is a different approach, and uh, for sharding, uh, what the, the, the trade-off is the usability, right? Because now um, it's very hard like, to to you know uh, do all the usual transaction that that we have because the blockchain essentially uh, are, are distributed in in different you know shard or regions, right? Um, it's, it's a little bit uh, technical, but you know it's it's harder to use. Um, so uh, what we want to do is to offer something that uh, you know that is seamless to the users. So that that won't you know affect uh, the the daily uh, you know transactions or daily activities that the user have been having on Kyber network. So that's why we we really want to to focus on Viden. Uh, oh, sorry, on 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 the channel uh, for our own solutions because we feel that uh, we we can offer a better user experience compared to other scalability solutions. Yeah, I I, I think we often forget that Viden is just another implementation of a state channel. It's not the the state channel solution for everything. Um, there will probably be services other than Kyber, which allow users to monetize their otherwise idle assets. And I know that in the, in, at least in the Kyber white paper, you guys put it um, that a lot of people, you know, will probably very, uh, uh, they will be very interested in being a reserve contributor, right? Because they can just, you know, put their money in the reserve and they can make some money off of it. But in my opinion, the competition, I don't think it will be only be between decentralized exchanges, but it will be between different services. Because if the services all offer some kind of monetary compensations for, you know, for, um, in, in a sense, staking their tokens, um, in this light, how can how can Kyber get the biggest reserve possible? How how do you guys plan on getting a huge reserve? Uh, interesting questions. Uh, so I think um, we needed to demonstrate that uh, you know operating a reserve in Kyber uh, uh, actually you know uh, yield some profit or some you know uh, some income for 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 the uh, users. And and uh, for that we needed to get more you know user to use Kyber network and do more trade on our platform. Uh, so that the reserve can, uh, you know, actually earn some, uh, you know, significant uh, profit from from the reserve, right? Um, so in order to like to compete to uh, with other uh, services, I'm not sure whether we need like, to compete with them because I think uh, the the uh, with the current you know state of the ecosystem, a lot of people have like idle assets, right? Like either like, from the the company that issues the coins, or from other wheels. I don't think uh, they they you know there are enough services for them like to stake their their, their tokens. Um, so we are less concerned about that, but at the same time we we still you know work uh, on our own platform to improve you know the user adoption, uh, the ease of use, uh, the ease of you know running a, a new reserve on our on our own exchange. Yes, uh, I have heard that uh, the reserves or reserve managers are actually making the ratios for it. And the reserves are actually there to actually gain the profits out of it by the trades of the users. Right. Is there any uh, other way that the actual reserve reserves can actually lose from that trade? If the, uh, if the trade actually happened and the price mm -hmm. actually fluctuated, uh, then is there a possibility that there can be a loss? And if the loss actually occurs, then who is responsible for covering that loss? Right. Uh, interesting questions. Um, so for the reserve, um, they need to uh, decide, um, you know, what is the rates that they that they are willing to offer, right? So if it happens that the market is too volatile and, and the price, you know, changes uh, right after the trade happens, then the reserve may have to bear the loss, but Bear in mind that uh, you know when the market is volatile, there will be like, people sell and buy at the same time, right? So uh, on average, the reserve won't lose much because uh, you know they 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 will earn enough from the spread like to cover all the price situation. 
uh, in the normal conditions they they can also like earn enough from the spread to cover uh, for the you know for the bad times so uh, i have a question about the fees so does reserve contributor pay fees when he takes profit or does he have to pay fees with or without the profit oh okay so uh, the fees here is based on the generation value right uh, so we are not uh, so you know from the platform point of view we do not know like whether the reserve is you know ha having any profit because it's is you know it's up to them to decide the price and and to de to determine like whether they want to uh, you know take profit or or, uh, or whether they are you know trying to sell some tokens and and you know uh can you know bear some loss of, of, of from doing that right um so we, we we don't care about you know how much a profit that the reserve is taking uh but what we do is you know for every trade we would take in you know some percentage of that trade value as the fees of the platform yeah thank you um let's uh let's go over into some like legal issues uh this is more interesting yeah this is uh because this is you know this is what happens when you go across different jurisdictions right will reserve managers need to kyc aml and what about contributors and users? I know you have like five different actors, right, in the, in the Kyber ecosystem. So, right, right. What's the, what's the KSC, KYC AML requirements for those? Um, so uh, for us, I think uh, from the platform point of view, we need like, to do the KYC uh, uh, on the uh, on the reserve, right? Because uh, they are the, the the people who are going to provide all the liquidity and, and process all the trade in our platform. Um, but from the user point of view, um, for the small, uh, so for now we are like you know using some rich based approach, right? Uh, so what we do is uh, because it's, it's a decentralized platform anyway. So, but at the same time, we also do not want to you know create any like legal issues for the reserve because they are the guy, the people who are you know doing the trade with the users. So what we do is uh, we allow all the smaller chess can happen on on Kyber uh, without any KYC. Because it's just really similar to to you know all the money changers out there, right? Um, when you go to a money changers uh, and and you want to convert some, for example, Korean one to USD, uh, you can convert up to some amount um, uh, um, so that you don't have it to uh, you know uh, provide your personal information or you know source of the fund. Uh, so we are we are using the similar approach uh, at Kyber. If you trade up to some certain amount, which is around like five thousand C dollars. Then you don't have to provide any KYC information, and you can just do it. Uh, but if you want, uh, you know, to 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 do more than that, uh, then you need like, to do you know KYC with us, and and so that we can protect the reserve, uh, you know, provider in in our platform. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, KYC and AML are the main concerns uh, for the regulators. They do not want us like to facilitate any like bad activities in our platform, right? And we also like, do not want that to happen. Yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna kind of play the devil's advocate. And you said there's a user cap, which is determined by KYC AML requirements, right? So there's different ra ratings for the users. But you know, one might argue that when you're talking about permissionlessness in exchanges, it's supposed to be a core characteristic of a decentralized system. So tell tell us how you see the rating system working in terms of in light of like permissionlessness because I, I can see some maximalists saying like how could you do that how can you ever introduce kyc aml into uh into your service so what do you what do you think about that? how do they work in harmony for you right so i mean the main concern about you know kyc and aml is is the user privacy right uh and and uh fortunately we 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 we, we, we we will be able to do that in a uh, you know a privacy preserving manner. So there are several projects that are doing that are supporting you know KYC and, and AML on the blockchains. So the idea here is that the users can just you know choose whatever firm, whatever firm that they that they are uh, you know happy with in order to provide the KYC and, and AML. And this firm they will provide the information of these users, uh, like maybe just the uh, ETH address of these users. Uh, to us right so so that we we know that this guy are clean and their source of money is clean as well and after that we can just like support uh, them on our platform without actually uh you know knowing who they are and where they get the money from because we already get the you know guarantee from some other service providers that this guy are clean 
so no uh, have any informations or actually hold any informations uh, of, uh, of the users so we still you know respect their privacy and and their uh you know online identity um in some sense does does a reputation system make sense in terms of like integrating that into kyber um reputation system only works uh, up to some certain amount right up to some certain uh, uh value of the of the trip uh so you can say that you know someone has been really good so far because he has been like trading only like one or two uh you know dollar trips on 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 the platform uh but you know are you are you happy if you if if, if he comes to your platform and do something like you know 10 uh, 10 000 us dollar trip I'm not sure, right? Because you know, all he has been doing so far is just like one or two dollars. He has no better to you know higher trade value. I'm not sure whether reputation system works. Yeah, and also because you're working across different um, varying uh, juris multiple jurisdictions with varying legal status, uh, what kind of compliance challenges have you faced so far, or are you facing currently? Right. Uh, so I think. Um, for us, um, we need to work with all the other wallets um, and, and other platforms that allow the user to interact with our uh, exchange, right? So um, these, basically we need to work closely with these wallets and platform uh, and, and ask them for the, for the requirement uh, on, on their local uh, traditions, right? So for example, I am talking, if they allow the user to trade on Kyber, then they also need to comply with the rules and, 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 and the laws uh, in the countries that they operate on. Uh, similarly, because we allow our users to operate and exchange on our website, kyber.network. So, uh, uh, and, and kyber.network is registered in Singapore, so we need it to follow all the local laws here. Uh, so basically, um, we need it to work with all these parties uh, to, to make sure that they do not you know, violate any uh, laws or, or you know um, make any legal offense. Oh, then I have a one question over a very controversial issue. Uh, it was very uh, very controversial in Korea as well when Bitfem or the other centralized exchanges actually list the tokens. Then the token price was very uh, impacted by those issues. Right. However, uh, recently Shapeshift ran into some issues with SEC and had to delist some tokens. Mm -hmm. uh, then what will Kyber Network do if regulations changes in such a way? Is, it, is there a possibility for you guys to actually delist following the regulations? Um, so, so far, what we have been doing is that we, we need uh, to ask for the legal opinion for, of all the tokens before we, uh, we can actually list them, right? So, because um, if we do not, First of all, we are not able to work with security token at the moment, so we needed to ask for the all the legal opinions uh, on the on, on on the utility of the token, and only after uh, you know having the legal opinion, we, we will be able to list them on our platform. Um, and later on, if there is any pressure from the uh, juridic jurisdictions, uh, uh, you know, from the regulators, then we probably have to do something either to delete some token or to you know move our base to some other countries because at the end of the at, at the end of the day there's still uh, you know a couple of, you know other identity uh, you know entities to operate the platform so we probably uh, need to need to uh, protect ourselves uh, so i guess that's why shapeship also uh, need to delete some token so um this is a similar question, but as Tristan said, uh, listing and delisting tokens can have can have massive impact on the price. So, do you have like a special or your own standard of listing or delisting the tokens? Uh, we have been we, we have been like you know uh, we haven't been working actually on that yet because you know <laughs> what we have done so far is just developing a platform and design a few other like marketing campaigns. Uh, we have been uh, we we haven't uh, worked on our own you know cr criteria uh, when when we want to list any new tokens, um, but I guess we will just like follow similar uh, you know um, uh, standards that other agendas they also have. Uh, okay. And I guess and I guess in the futures because 
uh, you know, uh, we, we can also like allow all the token holders to uh, vote whether they want to, you know, list any certain tokens. Yeah, right. I think, uh, yeah, I think there are a lot of questions or uh, questions over the viewers right now saying that the usage of Kyber Network Crystal and I actually had the question as well. According to the white paper, KNC paid by reserves are in order to gain their rights to gain profits out of the trade inside Kyber. Is that the only usage of Kyber network? Um, so currently it's the only usage, but we are going to introduce uh, you know, other products and, and uh, there, there will be the need for you know, KNC in these products. So we are going to introduce more utility for KNC. Then for the KNC as well, when there was a fee, then you guys say 95% will be burnt. And I just want, I just wanted to ask you this. Um, if you guys continue to burn the crystals, then mathematically, the some of the crystals will remain in the system. However, the numbers can drastically decrease in like hundreds or two hundreds of years. Uh, do you guys have any plans for stopping the burning system or to regenerate the crystals? Um, so the idea here is to you know, keep burning and, and to reduce the supply of the tokens as the adoption of the platform increases, right? Um, so we hope that if, you know, when the, you know, when the adoption uh, increases, then uh, the price of Kyber will also, uh, you know, increases, right? So we have like, to burn less amount of KNC every day. Uh, so although the value, the, 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 the value that, that we burn uh, is the same or maybe even like higher but the amount of knc that we have to burn is going to reduce so uh you know you know we, we, we burn, uh, uh after a long period of time uh the uh the total supply may you know approach zero but it will never be zero because you know uh, uh, one knc can be split into you know, very small pieces, right? Like up until, uh, you know, until something like 10 to, um, you know, 18 smaller pieces, which is a, a large number. So uh, even you have like 0 0.0001 KNC, it doesn't matter because the KNC remains and the price will go up, right? Yes, so yes. If, if there's a, I don't know what kind of incident it will be, but like, if there is an incident that you guys have to regenerate the some kind of a crystal, are you guys able to do the, do those? And do you guys have any plans to do it? Well, I, there's no uh, plan in any like foreseeable future. But later on, if we see the need to you know reduce the amount of like zero, right? <laughs> then then we can just you know uh, uh, probably uh, launch a new token that that uh, packed to the current KNC. Uh, so that you know one of that token equals to like zero point something 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 uh, knc uh, to you know make it more easier for the users to use our uh, token is there any reason that you burn 95 percent of fees what can you just lower the fee and take less and just burn all the fees you get um so 95 percent is just like some ballpark number that we have uh, in in the paper uh, so we need like, to pay for other expenses and and also like to other wallets uh, or website that introduce uh, you know users to our platform. Um, so currently, I think we are paying uh, if you know our token comes into the picture, then we are we are paying them around fifty percent of the fees. Uh, and after you know some of the uh, you know expenses, then then I think we burn something like thirty to forty percent of the fees. Uh, and this fees is uh, as a stable and it varies between different wallets. I had a question about like how the reserve is operated. Um, Cause is there, is there like a, I, I don't know what you call it a staking period. Can you like just put the money in the reserve, take it out, put the money in the reserve. Does that happen very often? Or if, if I'm a reserve contributor and I decided to contribute, is it up to the reserve to set the period at how, the, the minimum amount of time that I must Put, have the token in the reserve. So I think it's um, so for now. We, there's no like obligation for the reserve to do that uh, because uh, we just wanted to operate it in in a in a friendly way, right? But later on, uh, when you know when we have more reserve, then then we needed to ask them to actually commit for some certain amount of time before they can uh, withdraw any tokens. 
Interesting. Yeah, that that and that's happening because right now Kyber Network is running out of reserves, right? You guys are providing everything. Uh, so we also have uh, already a new third party reserve uh, that that also provides a liquidity in our platform. Uh, and and this guy are, are really interesting because what they do is they they have their own team to build all the software by themselves. So they are like totally you know independent uh, from <laughs> the Kyber Network team. And and they you know spend resources to to build uh, you know uh, the reserve software for themselves. Okay, I, I was slightly confused uh, in the white paper when you talked about your quote unquote new standard contract wallet, and so it seemed like there were two two issues to this. Like on the first hand, you said that the new standard contract wallet was is can receive payments from any feature tokens without any modification to the contract code. That sounds like any token that will come out, like it's gonna automatically be integrated into the Kyber, uh, Kyber, uh, Kyber wallet. And then the other one is, it'll allow the Kyber contract to send the user's newly converted token to his, her destination address on the user's behalf. Um, these are both like two features that the new standard contract wallet has, right? I was just confused because I wasn't sure if these were connected right, right. in any way. So uh, so these are, these are the, uh, for, for, uh, the, the features for the payment uh, you know, um, applications of Kyber Network because in Kyber Network, because we, we, we do everything on chain, right? So it makes sense for us to allow the, the, the payments, um, you know, from different tokens, um, uh, you know, happen on our, on our platform. So the idea here is if the merchants, they accept only Ether, right? And the user, they have like different tokens, then they can just like send the token via Kyber Network and we can convert everything on chain on the fly immediately and forward ether to the merchants uh, so that the merchant can just receive ether and the user they don't have to go to a centralized chain just to uh, um, and, um, there are there are several use cases in which you know the uh, the users uh they they need like, to 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 uh, receive something back from the merchants right like for example if you participate in some ico then when you send the ether there then you 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 expect to receive the token back from the contract right uh, to the address um, so that's why we needed to create a, a new standard wallet uh, for the users to make that happen um, it's a little bit technical um, but you know basically we create a new uh, smart contract wallet for the users and they can just like do everything uh, as a as a normal standard wallet yeah. The second part is just just to clarify. The second part is like what uh, Shapeshift does already, right? But you are doing it in a decentralized way. Uh, yes, but I think I think uh, what different is that we do it all here. so there's something time for the users, right? I think Tony, do, don't you have a question about platforms? Oh, so uh, going back to the plasma and sharding. Um, so as you have more reserves and the users, I guess scalability is a big issue. Right. So if the Ethereum network can't solve that issue, do you have any future plan to move on to the different platforms such as like EOS or may maybe Cardano or something like that? Well, I mean, uh, I already mentioned about our state channel solutions, right? Uh, so we are we are expecting to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, work on that uh, later on. Um, moving to other chains and platforms is also an option, and I and I think uh, uh, you know to Kyber we have no problem with having you know one Kyber on Ethereum and you know one Kyber on on different chain because essentially we can just replicate whatever we have on Ethereum and deploy it on on a on a di different chain, right? But the question here is that we need to go to uh, where our users are, right? Uh, on EOS and you know different chains, they're pretty new, and I don't think there's any activity over there uh, from the users you know side, right? Uh, so it makes sense for us like to uh, stay on Ethereum and and uh, actually uh, build our scalab uh, scalability solutions on Ethereum. And when you're talking about having a Kyber on e like another another chain, I think that will surprise a lot of people, but that's the part of what, what kind of like what you're attempting to do with uh, Peace Relay or anytime you talked about like uh, the Zcash Relay. So let's talk about that a little bit. Tell us about Peace Relay and how do you how you see it integrating into Kyber Network? 
Right. Uh, so Peace Relays uh, was an initiative uh, that started by uh, myself and a few other colleagues at, uh, I think, um, consensus, uh, consensus. So the idea of Peace Relay is to allow the users to move different coins and tokens uh, on Ethereum-based chain, right, to Ethereum and move that coin back. So for example, now we have Ethereum Classic, and we want to uh, support Ethereum Classic, uh, uh, you know, trading between ETC and, and a few other tokens on Ethereum. So how do we do it in a trustless and decentralized way? So Peace Relay allows the user to move their ETC from Ethereum Classic to Ethereum. So we can create something like ETC token on Ethereum. Uh, and one ETC token is packed with you know, one Ethereum Classic on Ethereum Classic. Um, and later on, if you want you know, to move this ETC token back to uh, Ethereum Classic chain, then we can just do it via Peace, Re Peace Relay as well. Um, so this is really interesting because later on, if you know, any banks or government want to create their, their own you know, uh, national currency token, right? Using Ethereum private chain, then we can use the same technique to move like all these national currency token on the public Ethereum chain, which is powerful. Uh, so we, we also have a separate team working on that. Um, and and it's, it's great because you know, this one is trustless and we do not like, need to rely, rely on any like, you know, validators or, or, or anyone to operate uh, the, the uh, you know, movement of different coins on uh, from different chain. Yeah, I I think it's I think it's so cool because I see it as I know you 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 eventually are gonna work with Cosmos. You're eventually gonna work with Polkadot, but you're seeing it as a stepping stone, right? Before we reach the like the full blown interchain, you're sharing data with each other across different chains. For you, it's exactly. just you know, it's just a like a two way peg way of uh like you know making making uh making sure that Kyber works across different chains. Exactly. So, so because we wanted to operate, uh, we, we want to support like different tokens and, and di different coins on Ethereum as well. Because if you see the, the trading volume uh, mostly happens on, you know, Bitcoin and, and other ERC20 tokens, right? Uh, so we, we, we want to, to support that use case as well. So we, we are, you know, we are working on, on a few other options to bring Bitcoin on Ethereum uh, network as well. So why, why did you... Um... Like move on from uh, the Zcash relay to Peace relay. Was there was there a reason for that? I think Zcash. Uh, there were some uh, technical challenges <laughs> because uh, verifying uh, zk snack on Ethereum was so expensive, and it, it was like almost impossible to do that. So that's why um, we we wanted like, to you know. Uh, uh, so that's why we uh, created that piece relay. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit, because what a, another function you you talked about the the private public thing. That thing is super cool, right? Because you could take any kind of um, like any pegged pegged national currency and you could start moving it over with private blockchains and public blockchains, and you could do it with public blockchains. But another thing that you offer is uh, you mentioned in your blog about gas oracles. So how can you how how can you explain that for the average person? Okay, uh, this one is uh, is is uh, actually developed by the other colleague, uh, a piece relay. But the idea here is that you want to um, so you want to to have some sort of like information about uh, you know how much gas or how busy the network is, right, uh, on chain, because currently there's no way for the smart contract to 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 know uh, how busy the network is. Um, so simply because. Economic, uh, you know, a scheme that requires the user to, you know, send or, or deposit or make some action before some certain amount of time. But if the network is so busy and the, and the user can just cannot like get the transaction go through, right? Then, uh, then it's not fair for the users because this is not his fault. It's, be, it's just because the network is so busy that he cannot send the transactions to to before the deadline. So if there's some way for the smart contract to understand that, oh, the network is so busy, so we should like give this user some more time for him to complete the actions, um, then then uh, it's, it's going to be more fair for for the entire uh, you know protocol. Uh, so this 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 is going to be applicable to like all the Casper or you know all the other crypto economics scheme 
uh, that relies on on the user action before some deadline. It's you, you. You just created like somehow you ended up creating another cryptographic tool that's gonna affect the crypto economics. And <laughs> it sounds yeah. I mean, I mean, P Peace Relay is and says like what you said, a gas oracle, right? An on chain oracle. And it yes. seems like Kyber because you guys are receiving all the data from the different reserve managers, right? The different prices. So it's yes. another trusted on chain. What well, you said, trusted on chain source for rate quotes, and that sounds pretty much like a decentralized oracle to me. Is that correct? Exactly, because uh, I, I think I think it's it's a trusted and trustworthy, uh, you know, on chain uh, price oracle because you can essentially do some action with this price, right? Uh, if we quote some price, uh, so you can just like trade whatever uh, the token that we support uh, using that price instead of some other on-chain uh, you know price oracle, which is just quote the price and they have like no uh, guarantee or, or no li liability to that price. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your uh, interesting inputs and your uh, opinions over that. Uh, going back to some of the problems over the uh, Kyber network, I, I don't see this as a problem, but I just I am just worried about a few other things. And uh, what are some kind of attack vectors in regards to reserve managers intentionally manipulating the rate to cr crash the system, or is there other kinds of a uh, attack vectors on the Kyber network that you guys are actually worried about? Um, so the reserve manager, so the way it works is that the reserve manager need to collect, you know, as much information about the market as possible before they can, uh, you know, quote the price on chain, right? And so if there's some, you know, powerful uh, individual that can, you know, uh, affect the entire market, then they can, they can, you know, make the reserve manager quote some wrong price. But if this happens, then I think uh, it's gonna affect uh, you know everyone anyway. Um, and I think there's another um, um, sort of like challenge for the reserve manager is that when the uh, network is so busy and he cannot like quote the price uh, you know uh, fast enough, then um, he may either have to stop the service or have to offer you know some really you know huge spread right to protect himself from you know all the uh you know fluctuation in in the in the network which is going to be bad for the users um uh so we are still working on that uh but it's not it's not a major problem given the current condition of, of the network anyway and of course you know the reserve manager they are always exposed to the you know market rates right because if some token is 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 so volatile then then um um there's always some chance that the reserve manager will, you know, uh, have to bear some loss due, due to the price of fluctuations. So I, I guess it's kind of time to wrap up the interview. So before we uh, lose you, uh, so how do you hope that Kyber Network change the environment of blockchain community or industry in general? Is it just like your vision to have like decentralized exchange or is there something beyond? Right, so I think um, uh, Kyber Network main vision is to operate as a decentralized exchange and a, a payment facilitator for the entire decentralized ecosystem. So something similar to, uh, you know, both NASDAQ and Visa combined, right? Uh, because uh, later on, we, uh, when you know more and more projects deliver uh, their products, we need you know, more to do on-chain conversion and to do like you know payments between different tokens, because most of the project what they what they require is that they require the user to acquire their native tokens in order to use the platform, and I think Kyber can you know help the users uh, to to uh, do that in a convenient way. Uh, and and provide them a you know better uh, user experience in this uh, decentralized uh, you know ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, before before we wrap up, I know we were supposed to do a demo, so if you could get that. Oh, ready. yes, demo, demo, yes. Uh, yeah. so I need like to share my desktop, I guess. Yeah, everyone, uh, be prepared to be amazed. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, let me just. Um, Let's see what kind of tokens that uh, Loi will use today for the demo. Doo -doom. Okay, it sounds scary. <laughs> let me just, uh, okay, let me share my screen. Absolutely. I, a lot of, there's a lot of questions about like how, like how Kyber works, like when can everybody use Kyber on the mainnet? Do you expect to see small to medium sized reserves to join Kyber network? And like, does, can we trade KNC for other crypto? But if you see the demo, I think a lot of questions will be answered. Okay. Awesome. I'm um, trying to see how I can say, oh yeah, I, I saw it. I saw it. Share. Yeah. This is the fun thing about the live stream, right? <laughs> yes you uh seeing my uh browser yes we can okay okay let's just go to kyber.network okay this is the uh interface for mm -hmm. you to access to our chains and this interface uh later on can be replaced uh by you know all the integration with other wallets and 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 website so you can have like different ways to access to to our uh exchange okay uh, so you just accept the terms and condition and get started so here we have like different options to to work with kyber network um so you can use metamask uh, you can use you know your uh key store files uh you can work with you know your hardware wallets or you, uh, if you are, you know, technical enough, you can enter your private key directly. Um, so here I will work with my ledger. Let me unlock my ledger first. Oh man, if we could just hear the sounds of Loy unlocking his ledger, <laughs> we'll know we'll know what his password is. Wow, wow, that's <laughs> please decode. I <laughs> captured the screen. <laughs> Okay, okay. Let's I already, see how okay. much is it how much is in? The oh. CEO of Kyber Network. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will uh, click my ledger. Um select the wallet. Right. So here you will see like a lot of tokens. Mm -hmm. Uh that, that we support. So you can view like all of them. Uh currently we support something like 15 tokens, um, excluding Ether. Mm -hmm. Um so you just like select some token that you want to trade. Uh, I want to work with uh, Elf, for example. Um, and Elf I have is chosen for today. <laughs> <laughs> so I have uh, more than one ether here. I just you know choose uh, to trade one Elf, and I am given some rate here, uh -huh. and um, I can choose to uh, determine what is my minimum rate. Because you know the rate may be may may fluctuate, right? Uh, after you send the transactions, the reserve manager may you know update the price at the same time. So here I can just say I don't want to get uh, the rate lower than nine hundred and thirty elf. Mm. Uh, I can also specify my gas price uh, if I want to um, make my trade faster. Then I just use like ten gigaway. And after everything is set, I can just click exchange uh confirm uh, the last screen gas price generation fees i need to click confirm and confirm on my ledger okay this, 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 I, is just, I, uh, this is just to make sure so like the reason you have the minimum price set is just in case the price makes a sudden dip right as right. you make the trade so if, exactly. if it makes a sudden dip it won't make the trade if it exactly so this is just to uh, protect the user. Mm -hmm. Ben, okay. I, have, I have one question. Uh, for the gas fees, you have to pay it with Ethereum, right? Yes. And if I, have, if I only have EOS, for example, then do I have to change some EOS to Ethereum and uh, get some Ethereum for the gas fee? Or does it automatically changes to Ethereum and pays for the gas and goes within it? Oh, uh, so we are, we are working on the letter. Uh, uh, you know case but for now you need to acquire ethereum in order to uh pay for the uh, gas but later on we can have some solution so that you can just you know pay uh directly from your eos okay so the trade is done everything is uh confirmed here uh i need to 
click on this to see what happens. Uh, so I get 500 elf deposited to my change. Sweet. Uh, I click on new change again. I will see that my balance of EOF uh, of F is, is credited. And uh, ether, I plus ether now. Yeah, now so, we'll... <laughs> so the what? entire process, so, so this is great because, you know, your coins never leave your wallets, right? The entire process happens entirely on chain. At no point in time, we keep or we, we uh, have the access to your coin. So even when Kyber Network get hacked, you know, you do not get affected. And front running is never an issue for you. It's not an issue because uh, because the price is caught by the by the uh, you know reserve, right? So the users they they know what they are you know what they are getting before they send the transactions. That's a really sweet demo, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, if you guys if 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 now Kyber is integrated into mobile, then it's game over. Um. It's okay. So the in let me just uh, turn up my screen share. Just and... from curiosity, right. what happens if you have if you don't have any reserve left? Um, so there's always at least one reserve, which is Kyber. <laughs> so, but we, you know, we are working with uh, a few other people. A lot of people actually request to be a reserve in our platform because they just, they just like don't know what to do with their coins, right? So. They just like need to have a, another like revenue to earn more, you know, profit and, and income from that, uh, you know, idle asset. And uh, speaking of, you know, integration with other mobile wallets, uh, it's going to happen uh, sooner than you think. So please, you know, uh, uh, watch out our, uh, you know, announcement. Do we see some uh, integration with some major wallets soon? There are a lot of announcements that we, ha we can expect in 2018, right? It, yeah, there, there are a lot. <laughs> so we, you know, we are working hard on on the platform development and integration with other, uh, you know, ecosystem uh, players. Um, but we do not like want to hype up our, you know, uh, price or or, you know, just do all the weird marketing stuff. Just, just one thing. You you talked about a uh, small to medium size. Uh, you talked about users who might have a lot of tokens, but they kind of don't know what to do with it. Maybe they just don't have the right connections to get whitelisted to go into a private sale. Who knows? But for <laughs> these people, it seems like their option would be to naturally to gravitate towards us using reserves. But what I what I want to ask is for the reserves, do you think there's an economy of scale at play? Meaning, how do you think the spread will be in terms of users? I mean, obviously the exchanges, the whales, they're definitely going to want to be a reserve contributor or operate their own reserve, whether it be public or private. But do you think smaller people with uh, smaller amounts of different tokens will band together and they will create many small to medium sized reserve to join Kyber network after you make that public to everyone? What do you think? Right. So um, a different way for them is to pull together and run some sort of like on-chain reserve uh that they can use some some fun management platform like you know melonport and, and a few other projects are, are working on uh to you know operate as a new reserve in in kyber so i think it's possible for them yeah it's super cool because i know another project that you did previously is smart pool so it seems yeah. like these are all like interconnected with each other for those of you who might not know smart pool um Smartpool was a project where uh, Loy and his gang, they basically replaced uh, mine op mining operators with just a smart contract. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and like what you said about you guys kind of being a payment thing, I think part of that is you want to offer a medium of exchange service. But you know now we, we have a market that's saturated with uh, decentralized exchanges. I read the consensus report. I was actually horrified how many decentralized exchanges there were or uh, under production. Um, and also, you know, like out of the three holy grails of cryptocurrency, which is a uh, decentralized exchange, stable coins and decentralized oracles, stable coin, you know, is what something that aims to uh, be like, you know, to put itself as the medium of exchange. But right. it seems like you're competing on both fronts, but one in a one in a decentralized exchange front and another in a medium of exchange front. So right. do you think what you're trying to do, your vision, and then 
some sort of stable coin can you can you guys coexist in the future what do you how, what's your take on it so so what what we aim to do is not to provide a medium of exchange but what we want to do is to be a you know a payment service provider right something similar to visa because uh you know we can just like do all the conversion in the background easily um so we can work with all the other stable coins uh you know, uh, some merchants just want to accept this stable coin. And, you know, for example, you only have Ether, right? And what do you do? So you just like send your Ether to Kyber and we can, you know, convert your Ether to, you know, the stable coin that the merchants wanted to receive and send the stable coin to the merchants. So we just want to provide the service, uh, the, the conversion service uh, as part of the payment, uh, which I think we are in the best position to do so. It's, it's I to me it's always sorry yeah yeah now 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 it's now it's becoming a lot a lot more clear because right. you know I think I don't know it's it's hard to imagine like because you imagine with, with all the different tokens you start imagining how the future ecosystem is gonna be is there gonna be like one stable coin that everybody uses or is you know exchange services like Kyber is that gonna be so optimized that we don't even think about all the different tokens that we use on a regular day to day basis exactly exactly. So I mean, it's it's just similar when you use your you know a credit card or your uh debit card, right? And and you go oversee, but your card only has like you know current one, like how are you going to pay you know uh, in USD? So you just re rely on Visa, right? Because you just tap the card and Visa will do all the conversion, uh, convert it to USD and send it to the merchants, and you don't know like what's what what happens in the background. So we are trying to do something similar with Kyber Network. I just have one more question. Um, I, I think Tristan and uh, Tony might be pissed at me, but I'm gonna continue nonetheless. Uh, what <laughs> you what, know? Yeah, I know. Uh, what initially attracted you to Ethereum, and compared to other blockchain protocol projects, what is Ethereum's competitive edge for you? Sorry, I think I uh, lost uh, the second part of the question. Oh, what is comp what is Ethereum's competitive edge over all other blockchain protocol projects? I see. Uh, so I think um, I started like, you know, uh, looking at blockchain and cryptocurrency research back in uh, early 2014. And uh, later on, I got, uh, you know, attracted by Ethereum because, you know, it's new and, you know, all the promises that and that, that the, this new blockchain, uh, you know, wanted to deliver, right? And they wanted like, to, to be a platform for all the decentralized applications. Uh, so that people can easily launch their own you know, decentralized chains, their own decentralized you know, economy and things like that. Um, so I, I, I look you know, further and I think uh, you know, there are a lot in this you know, new blockchains that we can work on. Um, so, and, and I you know, start interacting with the people in the, in, in the space. Um, and I realized that you know, these people, they are, they are much more friendly than, than the Bitcoin people. So sorry for the for for the you know Bitcoin maximalists in the audience, uh, but that that's my personal view because you know I I also like you know interacted in the Bitcoin Dev channel, and I feel like you know um, in the Ethereum ecosystem people are more friendly, people are more like welcoming, uh, so I you know started like falling in love with that you know economy uh, sorry with that community, and I uh, you know work on a few other projects uh, interacted with Vitalik and and a few other guys as well um and i think the main uh so at the moment uh the main like you know competitive uh point of ethereum is that they have a big ecosystem and they have uh, so many like you know people working on on new things uh you know innovate you know the entire ecosystem all together uh, if you look at uh, if you look at other chains, uh, you you see that there are only like a few people, a few core developers working on it, and it's 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 gonna be really hard for them like, to go to the level of Ethereum today, uh, with a huge and massive you know ecosystem, uh, different apps, different uh, you know applications and 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 different tools and software that that support the people, uh, the developer and and also the end users um yeah so that's you know that's my uh, uh comment so i hope i don't uh, upset any anyone in the audience no you you definitely upset the bitcoin maximalists but <laughs>
but it's i mean like i hey i i, I love uh i love bitcoin but yeah the developer uh ecosystem is quite harsh it's kind of like seeing um you know like the whole like linux developer ecosystem <laughs> like the culture there exactly. versus versus like take say like so i'm a i'm a, I'm a javascript dev so i just say like JavaScript didn't start out as the fanciest thing, but it's like the friendly, and then it just keeps getting more and more people. So at the end of the day, the ecosystem and the social community really pays off. Oh. Got it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, before we before we sign off, Loy, um, what's the best way for people to contact you, and what's the best way for people to get to know more about Kyber Network? So uh, you can just go to our Telegram channel. Uh, it's at uh, uh, you know just. Uh, just search for Kyber Network on Telegram. You will see a, a channel of around 10,000 people. Uh, you can also like go to uh, our subreddit, which is at, you know, uh, also the, at the handle of Kyber Network. Uh, our Twitter is also very active. Um, search for Kyber Network on Twitter. Uh, please you know, do not uh, send any ether to any account. <laughs> uh, so I am also on, on Twitter at uh, Loy underscore Liu. Uh, you can you can find me there. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all the audience members who who are tuning in. We'll probably edit out some things about like peace relay, all that juicy stuff that you want to hear, and then make sure it goes viral to get more traction. Um, and yeah. as before signing off, yeah, this is uh, Cian Cian from the Blockchainers Studio Decentral Nance, and and Tristan from Blog Art Mister Blockchain and Studio Decentral. Tony from the same three channels. <laughs> All right. And we had Loy. Loy, please say goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been great. Enjoy the show. All right. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a good day. Please uh, hit, uh, you know, hit like, comment, or su and subscribe to our channel. We'll try to bring you more information and uh, more, more meaningful conversations like what we had with Loy. All right. Have a great weekend. Bye. Awesome.